Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Ingram. I'm the director of CERDA, class director of RC for uh, Research Initiative, and welcome to an open lecture of Community Arts. The lecture is all that jointly by the RC for Research Initiative, uh, Cooper Center for Culture Policy Research, and the University of the Arts and Cities, Canada Center for Educational Research and Academic Development for the Arts. Our speaker today is Grafla Matarasso from the UK. Uh, he has worked in community arts since 1981 as an artist, producer, researcher, writer, and trainer. As freelance, he works with uh, art organizations, foundations, and public bodies, and has experience of community based cultural work in about 40 countries. He has published influential work on the social outcomes of participation in the arts and on the history, theory, and practice of uh, community arts. He has authored, for example, Use of Ornament, Use or, or, uh, Use of Ornament, the Social Impact of Participation in the Arts, and he has also written on the depoliticization of community art in Britain. Today's lecture, A Restless Art, 50 Years of His Community Art in Theory and Practice, is based on his latest book, A Restless Art, that will be published by the uh, Congress uh, Albankian Foundation later this year. Please welcome Professor Professor. Thank you very much. Oh, and before you start, I will send around the name list. Please sign on. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I know I see some faces from yesterday. Um, so I, I will try to say something different today for you in particular. Um, what I'm what I am going to do is to do two things, and in, in two halves, really. First of all, I'll try and give you uh, an overview of the origins and the history of community art and participatory art uh, in the UK. Um, and that will be the, the first half of the, of the lecture. And then we'll have a short break and then after that, I'll look at a bit more theoretical ideas uh, around intentions and also try to make, to explain why I think there is a difference between uh, um, participatory art and community art that is worth uh, understanding and, and thinking about. Um, I will show you quite a lot of projects. Um, they're partly to give you something to look at, to make the rather abstract things that I will say a bit more concrete and tangible. And sometimes I will, I will talk about them um, when it's, it's relevant and necessary. Um, so, uh, as you just heard, I started working in community arts in 1981. Um, and it's been a remarkable period of 35, nearly 40 years uh, since then, where what I have seen happen is participatory art move from a time when it was really very marginal and marginalized and not well understood to becoming something which is completely normal now. And part of what I want to do during the course of, of the next hour or so is to explain how I think that has come about and what its meaning is. Um, the, uh, uh, when I talk about participatory art, um, it's important to say that uh, for quite a long time, I didn't like that term. I have come to understand and accept it as a useful catch-all term that covers so many of the, the um, ideas and labels that have been attached to this practice. So participatory art uh, includes all of these things and more that have become more or less familiar in uh, our practice and discourse in the last uh, 40 years. Um, I think that when we look at all those 
terms. Of course, each of them has its own theories, its own practitioners, its own advocates. Um, uh, but they all have more in common with each other, even though they are very keen to stress their differences from each other. They have more in common with each other than they do with conventional art practice as it has been uh, uh, developed since the late 18th century. So this is the bit I'm afraid that I do have to, to repeat from yesterday for those of you who were here, because those of you who weren't here need to, to understand this. this. All of those ideas that I just outlined, I think can be uh, encapsulated in one simple, very broad definition, which is that participatory art is the creation of art by professional and non-professional artists. So everything that you saw on the previous slide could be described as the creation of art by professional and non-professional artists. And this is a very deliberately broad definition. In the second half of my talk, I'll talk about community art, and you'll see that I have a much narrower definition when we come to talk about that. Um, there are two ideas in here. The first is the creation of art, the second is professional and non-professional artists. But before I talk about those, I want to just draw your attention to the fact that I don't talk about arts in the plural. Uh, and I don't talk about community arts. I talk about art because participatory art is the creation of art. It is an art practice. Arts is a bureaucratic policy concept that covers a field of activities. We're not concerned with that here. We are concerned with making art. So let me explain why I have these two elements that I think are irreducible. So the creation of artwork, of an artwork. This is a, 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 a performance by a, a group of professional and non-professional artists uh, in Stoke-on-Trent uh, that took place in 2016 and it came out of a project that was intended to celebrate the presence of people who have migrated to Stoke-on-Trent. And so some of the people that you see there are people who've come to live in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, others are people who uh, were born and brought up there. It was a, an ambitious interactive performance with um, individual stories uh, that took place in a building that was originally built as the Wedgwood Institute. Stoke-on-Trent is a is a factory city, the home of uh, the, the ceramics and pottery industry in the UK. And Wedgwood, some of you may, may know, is a, one of the great names of the, the British ceramic industry. This institute was built for uh, the, the workers of the Wedgwood uh, company to pursue cultural activities. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But what you're seeing here is the creation of an artwork. The, the reason people came together was to make art. They did, they learned a great deal. There were social impacts to, to some of what they did. There were cultural impacts. Uh, and there was a political dimension to their project. But in the end, what they were doing was making an artwork. So there is a lot of participatory activity around art that is not participatory art in my terms. For instance, most obviously, art education. I don't think that art education is participatory art. It is art education. And it's important to understand the difference. Similarly, there is a lot of the use of art for other goals. And I'll come back to that again in, this, in the second half of the talk. Um, that may be a form of social intervention or uh, 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 community development. But it is not, I believe, art or participatory art. The other element of my definition 
is that it involves professional artists and non-professional artists. And I think this is a, an idea which people sometimes find difficult um, because I, I don't think that, I, I don't have much interest in, in a special status of artists. I think that you become an artist by making art. If you do that a lot, if you even do it all the time, then you become a professional artist. You are recognized as such by other people. They say, she's an artist. And as a professional artist, you acquire skills, you acquire experience, you train your imagination, you probably situate your work within a discourse and a history of the field in which you work. That gives you certain strengths and abilities, but it also uh, is not the only way to be an artist or to make art. You can be a non-professional artist by making art just occasionally, just in the moment when you need to make it. Now the image that you're looking at is a performance that I saw in a youth prison in Leiria in Portugal. It was a performance of Don Giovanni uh, that was uh, developed over a, quite a long period by the local music school. Um, the performance of Mozart's opera um, involved professional and non-professional artists. So some of the singers, most of the singers were professionals, although the commandatore was actually the director of the prison. The part of Leporello, who was uh, Don Giovanni's servant, was played by the young men that you can see on stage in the image. They played it as a, as a choral piece. So they sang that part and this is the finale when they are performing a rap that they had written and added to the opera um, and which the uh, professional musicians are playing. Now, and I'll come back to this, there is a difference between the kind of art making that the non-professional artists contribute to this work. It is different in nature and in quality but not necessarily in power and in value from that which is brought by the professional singers. And participatory art happens when you bring those two groups together. And it is in bringing those two groups together that you create something altogether different, altogether difficult, complex, unstable, which is why I describe this as a restless art. Now, one of the things that's really important to say about my concept here of professional and non-professional artists is that this is entirely separate from questions of quality. In the same way that uh, it is perfectly possible to be um, uh, a, a keen amateur runner and a keen professional runner, the runners are doing the same thing. They're doing it largely to the same standards and for the same purposes, but they are doing it differently and the, what they're doing has a different place in their lives. So I am not saying, in saying that there are professional artists and non-professional artists, that they are all equally good artists, any more than I would say that all professional artists are equally good. The quality of art is something that we can only decide for ourselves, individually and collectively, and often through discussion. And it is unstable. It doesn't stay the same. What we think of art today, what, we, what it means, how we interpret it, is not the same as it was 40 years ago or 140 years ago. So uh, it's really important to understand participatory art as a concept separate to whether you think it's well done or not well done. In exactly the same way as you can understand classical music or painting as a concept that can be done well 
or not well. Participatory art, though, like all art, is entitled to be judged on the basis of its highest achievements. In other words, if we look and try and consider what the value of participatory art is, we should look at the best of its production. That is what we do with classical music. That is what we do with painting. We don't say painting is a mediocre art form because there's a lot of mediocre painting around. There is a lot of mediocre painting, but it doesn't mean that painting is not a cornerstone of Western culture. This is important to say because part of the struggle between the established art world and the participatory art sector has been about quality. And part of the bad faith that the established art world has in regard to the participatory and community art sector is very often to judge it on its most mediocre work rather than to judge it fairly, as I would say, on its best work. This is an example of how ambitious participatory art can be. It's, a, it's an image taken by Susan Mycellus as part of a long project with women in refuges in uh, the black country west of Birmingham with an organisation called Multistory. And I include this image here now because if you want to go and see the original image, you'll have to go to the Jeu de Paume in Paris, where there is a retrospective of Susan Mycellus' work as one of the great American photographers happening now. So you can see that it is possible to, for artists who are working at the highest standard with the highest esteem of their profession to be doing really very important participatory work with people as professional artists working with non-professional artists. And it is also possible for mediocre artists to be doing mediocre, pe mediocre work. What we have to ask is, what is the best work and what does it say, what does it mean, how is it happening, how is it made, what is its value? Before I go on, I want to suggest that there are two exceptions to uh, my definition of participatory art. Uh, two big areas of work that I would not include in my concept of participatory art. The first is participation in contemporary art. This is a, there is a blurred boundary here and some contemporary art I would consider to be participatory art. But this is a, an example that I think I don't consider to be participatory art. This is a, um, an artwork, an installation called Sea of Hull, which was undertaken in, uh, created in 2016 in Hull in Eastern England by the American <coughs> artist Spencer Tunick. Spencer Tunick's work, if you're not familiar with it, always involves photographing generally large numbers of uh, native <coughs> people in public spaces. Uh, they're not always painted blue. Uh, that was the idea behind calling it Sea of Hull, because this is a port. 3,000 people turned up, and uh, they covered themselves with blue paint, having taken their clothes off, and they stood where Spencer Tunick told them where to stand. Now the reason that I don't consider this participatory art is because actually the people that you can see are not acting as artists. They are material. They have no actual active presence in the making of this artwork. If 3,000 different people turned up, the work would be indistinguishable from the work that was actually made. And that is true of quite a lot of work which is called participatory in the contemporary art field. There is not actually an active 
capacity for the non-professional people to change the nature of what is happening. Now, you can think this is interesting art or not interesting art. Um, the one thing that I would say is that the people who take part in it often, to judge by the comments, their comments afterwards, they often find it a rewarding and sometimes a, an artistically powerful experience. But that also doesn't make it participatory art. The other exception that I would make is amateur art. Although amateur art can often be very ambitious, and this is, a, this is an image taken from a project I did where I, I wrote a book about a remarkable uh, amateur theatre company uh, in uh, West Bromwich, which uh, has been going since 1937, and puts on very high standard of uh, theatre work in thousand-seat theatres, which it hires for the week and manages to make money doing. They also work with professionals in that they work with a professional director, professional choreographer, and a professional music director. But they are not trying to change the work that they are recreating. In this case, this is a scene of, of, of they were doing the producers. They are replicating an existing uh, production that they gave gain great pleasure and satisfaction from doing, as do their audiences. But I don't think they are creating new work. So in that sense, I don't think that this counts as participatory art. OK, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about participatory art, this creation of artwork by professional and non-professional artists working together. How did we get here? Why do we need to talk about this thing? Why, where did this idea come from and why was it needed? Well, conventionally, uh, when we talk about the emergence of community art, it tends to be described as something that happened in the 1960s, which is true, I'm not come on to that. But I think that what happened in the 1960s was only the latest expression of a movement of, of a movement for cultural democracy that has been going on for nearly 250 years. And it's important to understand the roots of this, partly so that you understand the concepts involved, but partly also so that you understand if you work in participatory or community art, that you are not a new idea. You actually have an artistic tradition that is centuries old and on which you, you can from which you can take pride and on which from which you can learn. That I think the starting point for me happens in the Enlightenment when philosophers, notably Immanuel Kant, but others, invented the idea of the fine arts. Until they came up with that idea that there was a certain kind of art which had a universal and transcendental value. People just talked about art, or the arts, or sculpture, or painting or singing. What the Enlightenment did was invent a concept which would prove to be immensely powerful in the next 200 years. It turbocharged art because it empowered artists working within certain uh, ideas that they had outlined. It gave them huge authority, huge energy and a whole field of new ideas. Crucially, it gave them an idea of taking a critical relationship to society that hadn't really existed in the same way before. There's a very good book by uh, the American philosopher Larry Shiner called The Invention of Art, 
which documents some of this. One of the things that he describes, he says, before the modern category of fine art could be established, three things needed to come together and gain wide acceptance. A limited set of arts, and conventionally the fine arts includes poetry, music, by which they meant classical music, sculpture, uh, painting, sometimes architecture, sometimes one or two other things. But they are specific things, they are forms. So a limited set of arts, a commonly accepted term to easily identify the set, which was the fine arts themselves, and some generally agreed principles or criteria for distinguishing that set from all the others, which were essentially aesthetics, the birth of aesthetics, an idea that belongs to that time. We didn't, it wasn't a word that existed before the Enlightenment. The downside of the fine arts as defined by Immanuel Kant and other Enlightenment philosophers was that they mistook the elite culture of their time and place for a universal <coughs> form of supreme value and power. And that idea has remained sometimes spoken, often unconscious, in Western culture until the 1960s. It remains true now, but as I will argue shortly, it has been in decline since the Second World War. But already, from the very start, it was not accepted by everyone. It was rejected by a number of artists. For instance, artists like Charles Dickens, who wrote specifically and directly for a mass public, both reflecting the experience of that public from whom he himself had come, and using <coughs> new methods to reach them, weekly cheap newsletters rather than expensive books, uh, and using a language that was aesthetically uh, different to the language of fine art. But it was also resisted uh, very directly by working people themselves, because there is a correlation in history between the, the Enlightenment, the emergence of the concept of the fine arts, and industrialization, the growth of the industrial society, and other not insignificant things, including uh, uh, West European uh, empire building and colonialism. Those new urban populations sought to reclaim their right to participate in the arts. And this image, which you can see, is a mechanics institute in a small town in the north of England, originally built in 1852. One of the ways in which they did this was to organize themselves to learn about art and culture, to practice amateur theater, to learn to play music, partly because they saw art and culture as a form, as a, as a route to social mobility. And to give you one example, I came across the Salford Lyceum. Salford is a town uh, on the edge of Manchester. In 1840, it was a brand new town. It was estimated that it had about 40,000 people living there. Um, in 1839, some of the working people of Salford created the Salford Lyceum. Within a year, it had 2,000 members out of 40,000 inhabitants, each of whom were paying eight shillings a week, uh, sorry, eight shillings a year to be a member of the Lyceum, which meant that it was financially self-sufficient. 160 of them were boys or women, and one of their members actually led a campaign to get Saturday afternoon off work
from the Manchester Mill owners, the first successful campaign anywhere in the world. And part of, their, part of his argument was that working people needed time for self-improvement. So this idea that art and culture is for everyone is very old. This is the outside of the Wedgwood Institute that I showed you before. A very proud building that shows the determination of working people to establish their own right of access to art and culture. And another quote from Larry Shiner, who confirms this, radical resistance to the deep divisions of the art system, sometimes on behalf of craft, in the sense of functional or popular arts, sometimes on behalf of the older union of art and craft, in the sense of trying to reintegrate art and society, or art and life. This has been going on since the beginning. A couple of other more recent uh, examples before we arrive at community arts itself. The Oxford and Bermondsey Shakespeare Society was founded in 1912 by uh, middle class people to try and bring Shakespeare to the working uh, boys of South East London. And this quote which you can read I took from a report written about the Oxford and Bermondsey Shakespeare Society's uh, uh, activities. It's a much longer report, uh, it's very interesting. But what is striking about it is what is said here. Their passion for drama lies in their keen enjoyment of the acting as a form of expression and legitimate self-display and the intensely valuable training of the team spirit. That could be written in an evaluation today about a social, socially oriented theatre programme. The language would be a little different, but the sentiment would be largely the same. And one other person to mention in the context of the radical roots of community arts. This is Joan Littlewood, most famous today for, for a play and a film called Oh What a Lovely War, which was the, uh, uh, I suppose in some ways one could say, a, uh, a radical pacifist uh, interpretation of the First World War, created at the Theatre Royal, which you can see behind you, in the she moved there in the 1950s, uh, when the East End of London was still uh, largely uh, covered with bomb sites. The quote that I've included there is from her vision of a fun palace, what she called a fun palace. She wanted to build what we would probably now describe as an art centre, in which working people could do and see and take part in anything they wanted. So she says, Choose what you want to do, or watch someone else doing it. Learn how to handle tools, paint, babies, machinery, or just listen to your favourite tune. Dance, talk, or be lifted up to where you can see how other people make things work. It goes on. Uh, sit out over space with a drink and tune in to what's happening elsewhere in the city. Try starting a riot or beginning a painting. The radical roots of community arts have always been there. And when, in the 1960s, that first generation of baby boomers invented what they called community art, they were drawing on things that they were probably not uh, entirely conscious of, but were very important to them. Now, that first generation of community arts, this is, a, this is three of the founders of Amber Collective, who studied the first of their, of their generation, of, of their families, to study in an art school in the 60s. They went to what was then North London Polytechnic, uh, studying under some of the, the great figures of the pop art movement. They are particularly interesting to me in this context because um, uh, they turned their back on that work because they did not want to turn their back on the working class communities that they had grown up in. So uh, they, went, they moved from London to Newcastle and have spent the, last, the next 50 years documenting the ordinary life and culture of uh, the northeast of England. This is one of their earliest films 
when it was still a centre of ship making. This is a film called Launch. They went on to, to do both participatory art and documentary art uh, and are still, still exist, still working as a collective and still standing up for their principles. They were joined by many other artists and they explored a number of different forms and ideas. Um, inflatables gave people a new sense of what the possibilities of sculpture could be. They were able to take these things out into working class communities, uh, sometimes with, with quite high ideals, but to make, uh, make contemporary art ideas available to ordinary people. Now, I think that although the community arts movement is today generally described as being left-wing in its ideas and in its um, uh, politics, and that is largely true, but not entirely so. Uh, because it was left-wing, and because it emerged in the 60s and largely, as I will explain, died out in the late 80s, it is often seen to have failed. I think that is a simplistic narrative. It's simplistic partly because of what happened after community arts ran out of energy, but it's also simplistic because I don't think that, <coughs> that the, the principal challenge of community arts was to, was a political one in, a, in the sense of party politics. It was a challenge in, uh, it was a challenge to the art world in the tradition of that challenge that had been going on since the Enlightenment. In other words, the artists who made up Amber Collective and the three or four hundred other young artists who came out of art schools in the late 60s and early 70s and established community arts wanted to make art in a different way. They rejected the economics and the values of the art world. They rejected the art world's lack of interest in ordinary people and ordinary people's lives. And they wanted to create work that was aesthetically and artistically different, as well as happening in different ways and in different places. So, one of the um, one of the iconic uh, expressions of that wish to break out of the art world system was uh, the street mural, and this is a a, a, a good e example because it, it shows both sides of that. It shows both the broader and the and the narrower political centre. This was painted by uh, Steve Love and Carol Kenner of Greenwich Mural Workshop in 1975 uh, with the residents of Floyd Road in Charlton in South East London. Floyd Road was due to be demolished um, for redevelopment and the residents didn't want it to be demolished, they wanted their houses to be refurbished. And working with the artists, they represented themselves pushing back the bulldozers and repairing their houses. And in fact, you can go and see not only that mural today, but the whole of Floyd Road, because in its very particular uh, political aim, it was successful. Greenwich Mural Workshop is one of the, um, it was the organization I originally trained with as an apprentice muralist and printmaker uh, about six years after this was, was was painted. But the point about this was that it was a form of art that was visual and public, it was clearly outside the gallery world, it was non-commercial uh, non in the sense that it could not be commodified, you couldn't sell this work. They also created an aesthetic which, de which depended on a system of creating three kind, three tones of flat colour so that everybody could contribute to the painting of this work. 
And uh, yesterday I was asked if I was going to show some of my work, uh, and so I've added a couple of things in, in this presentation. This is a mural that I painted uh, in Newark uh, in 1985, where I was then working as a community artist. Um, I painted it with two other artists, much better painters than me, um, called Bill Ming and Nadia Nagwal. And this is us being congratulated by the new director of the Arts Council at the time of the, of the uh, film, of the mural's completion. What's useful about showing you this image, apart from, uh, and on, the, on this side you can see it today, so it's still not in too bad condition. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the reason for showing you this as well, apart from um, uh, showing you something that I have done, is that it was in doing this work that I understood the limitations of mural painting for participatory and community art. Because actually, um, it took six months to do, uh, it, and there was very little community involvement in it, because people didn't like the idea of going up scaffolding and spending long days painting things on walls. And so by that time, I had already moved into other forms of, of creative work that proved to be much more effective. The other iconic uh, expression of, of, the, of the age in terms of the visual arts um, is the silkscreen poster. Again, it was deliberately uh, understood to be a non-commodifiable form of art production. Then, and at the time, people did talk about putting the means of um, cultural production in, in the hands of everyone. These are images taken from a feminist uh, women, a feminist print workshop called Sea Red, uh, who did all of their work with a uh, generally a, um, a, a political artistic vision but again always working with people and this is an image of a print workshop of the time from a film that was made about community print shops this is lentil road print community print shop that gives you some idea of how basic facilities were one of the things that has happened in the time since this image was a meaningful kind of uh, expression of community art, of course, is that the means of cultural production have been placed in, if not everyone's hands, in most people's hands through digital technology and the internet. So that now the idea that um, being able to print some posters um, was meaningful really uh, is out of date. Um, other examples, this is also some of my work with children, uh, doing, working with a photographer called Ross Boyd. Uh, again, this is before the age of digital technology, so these are hand-printed uh, photographs. And finally, the, the, in the area of theatre, um, the boundaries between community arts and community theatre were, were somewhat complicated. There was both radical theatre happening, these are posters from some of the radical theatre companies at the time, the Welfare State, uh, 784, who took their name from the fact that, as it says at the bottom of the poster, 7% of the population of this country owns 84% of the wealth. I think nowadays they probably have to revise those figures in a negative direction. Um, so there was a ferment of this work, and I want to finish talking about community arts with perhaps the iconic organisation of the period. Welfare State. Interestingly, Welfare State, which was founded by Sue Fox, John Gill, and a couple of other people, they started as art students. They studied fine art. They did not study theatre. But they very quickly found that by doing spectacle and theatre events, they could involve and engage far more people. Their work proved very popular uh, and it grew. They, they even toured internationally. They finally got to a stage. This is an image from one of their iconic performances 
which was the burning of the Houses of Parliament, which the, was done the last, for the last time in 1985 in London for an audience of 15,000 people, at which point they decided that they were in danger of becoming involved in spectacle rather than community art, and took a, completely, uh, a complete rethink of what, they, what their work was. But by using, by both having very limited uh, resources and using different kinds of uh, materials, they created an aesthetic for their work which clearly demarcated it from the artistic, the, the other artistic, professional uh, artistic production. And the iconic example of that is the, the paper lantern, which I think it's probably fair to say is, is uh, Welfare State's legacy to the, to the world. After the big show in uh, London in 1985, Welfare State relocated to Ulverston in the northwest of England, small town, a rural area. And one of the things they started there was a lantern procession where everybody could make their own lantern out of willow sticks and paper. And uh, it became a kind of new ritual moment in the life of, of the town. The Ulverston Lantern Parade continues today even though Welfare State hasn't existed for more than 10 years now, continues as an entirely independent, self-generating thing, and it has been imitated in many parts of the UK and indeed in many parts of, of the world. Um, one of the uh, early members of Welfare State, Mike White, who is an old friend, um, has written about this, uh, and he describes the lanterns and the lantern parade as a discrete externalization of personal feelings within a neighborhood spectacle. And there is something very magical, very uh, intimate and yet public that is distinctive and unique to uh, this form of practice that does, didn't exist before. There are lots of other ways in which that community art uh, work created new ways of um, new forms of expression, but I think the Lantern Parade is emblematic of them all. In the late 1980s, the community arts movement fell apart. Um, it fell apart both publicly uh, in a big conference that happened in 1986, at which a manifesto was presented and not accepted, uh, but it also fell apart simply for human reasons, because the young people who had started it were now in their 30s or early 40s. They had, uh, many of them had children. They didn't have the energy that they had. And by the late 80s, the neoliberal economic revolution led by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan had clearly won in the United Kingdom. And the idea that any kind of leftist political project was viable, um, many, most people had given up on. So quite a lot of people left community arts for quite human reasons, like they needed a, a regular salary. Uh, they needed to be in one place. Welfare State moved to Alverston partly because uh, John Fox and Sue Gill's children were then, uh, I think, eight and five or something like that, and they needed to have them in school. So there were very simple human factors. Um, by, the, by the time, by the late 80s, though, the resistance from the art establishment to the idea of community arts had taken its toll. It didn't have a good reputation. It was seen by many people as low quality work, uh, politically oriented, um, and uh, just out of date, out of step with the brave new world of money that was uh, exciting people in the late 80s in Britain. The people like me who were working in the community arts field 
uh, were forced to find other ways to survive. This is, uh, again, some examples of what I was doing at the time. I was working for an arts and disability organization called East Midland Shape. So we worked a lot in institutions and uh, with disabled people in the community. And we found that we could more easily secure funds for our work from social services departments and from health authorities than from the Arts Council. And so we, like a lot of other people working in community arts at that time, began to develop a, a narrative and a way of, of, of thinking that showed the value of our work in social terms. Um, it, it had always been there. We had always understood that to be the case. We always believed it. We simply had to learn to talk more about that in the context of um, uh, the, the policy needs of uh, urban regeneration companies and social services and education and other partners. Um, sometimes the work we were doing would be indistinguishable from community arts. These are images taken from, in some ways, one of the most political projects I was involved in, which was around the, the closure of psychiatric hospitals in the late 1980s, <coughs> early 1990s in the UK. This was a project about giving people who were living through that experience a voice, both through images, they worked with a photographer in residence and a writer in residence. And I will come back to these images, or to one of these images, uh, later in the context of this. In 1997, I published a, a research report uh, that had come out, really, of my, my, my work in those social contexts and my recognition that many of the people that I had worked with had had life-changing experiences through the work that they had done in community arts. And this research, of which these are just some of the reports, um, was the first large-scale study of what I then called the social impact of participation in the arts. Um, I would not call it the same thing today. I would not talk of social impact in the way that I did, incidentally. Um, I'm happy to talk about why not um, later on, if you would like. Um, but it was an influential report, partly because it happened to be published at the same time as there was a change of government. So the, the Labour government was elected in, 19, in uh, April 1997, I think, and this was published a month later. There is an argument that says this was very influential on shaping government policy on, for the arts for the next 10 years. Um, I don't flatter myself that that is true. I think that what happened is that the Labour government already wanted to have a more socially oriented arts policy and it was able to pick up on the work that I had done and use that to defend a position that it already held. Uh, that year, uh, sorry, in 1999, the, the new government set up something called the Social Exclusion Unit, and uh, one of the things, w at the time we felt it was a major achievement, they set up a number of policy action teams to review government policy in terms of, uh, in, in a number of ways, to look at social exclusion, and we felt it was a real victory at the time that one of those um, uh, uh, policy action teams on which I was invited to which I was invited to contribute was uh, on arts and sport and in fact I, I contributed some principles for uh, arts and sports in community development work based on my own experience and my research what happened since is that this work to some extent uh, became much more widespread. 
So that idea that community arts failed in the 1980s is false in the sense that actually what it did was infiltrate cultural institutions and contemporary art and the practice of many artists. Um, it became much more normal. So it became uh, a standard thing in schools. There was a, another rep government report at the time led by, under the chairmanship of Sir Ken Robinson, who's a visionary uh, thinker on creative education. It was published called All Our Futures that led to the creation of a program called Creative Partnerships, which worked in a thousand schools in the UK, a thousand of the worst performing schools in the poorest areas. And it worked until 2010 when it was closed uh, using the excuse of the uh, austerity uh, uh, policies, but a change of government. But by that time, there was a formal evaluation by uh, Ofsted and uh, the department, uh, the, the Office for Standards in Education and by academic researchers showing that there had been a, a, a statistically significant improvement on the school performance of the children who had taken part in the Creative Partnership schools. Now, since then, participatory art has become a completely normal, everyday part of life. This is an image from Beata, uh, a festival that takes place in Ireland, has done since the mid-1990s, and uh, is a festival of uh, art and ageing. And crucially, it was created and is run by Age and Opportunity, Ireland's principal organisation supporting the uh, older, older people in the population. It is not run by an arts organisation at all. Uh, there's a very interesting evaluation of the Altona undertaken by the University of Ireland uh, in 2008. Um, there is an estimate that it is now reaching something like 10% of the population of Ireland. It is a mass uh, uh, program. Other ways in which participatory art have become normalised, uh, this is a, an image taken from a workshop at the Icon. <coughs> Many cultural institutions took on the ideas and practices of community arts within their education and outreach programmes, and that has become uh, entirely uh, normal and standard. This is an image of Gareth Malone, who's a, a TV personality now, and a choir master, but who originally worked in the education department of the London Symphony Orchestra. He's made a series of TV programmes, immensely popular, getting people to sing and to form choirs in the workplace and in other contexts. Again, showing how much the idea that art and performance could be for everyone. Here's another image that underlines that. This is from Liverpool uh, Primary Care Trust. Also, uh, it no longer exists because of the changes in policy since 2010. They created a decade of health and well-being. And you'll see under the purple tab that arts and culture is one of the mechanisms by which they aimed to improve the health and well-being in a public health initiative of uh, the city of Liverpool. Now, I want to show you one last um, example of uh, the connection between the welfare state, the community arts ideas and participatory art um, before we'll, we'll take a break as we get to the end of the, the history. These are images from a project called Roots and Wings. And in some ways, Roots and Wings is a, both a completely ordinary participatory or community arts project, but also a wonderful one. It happened in a, a school in West Yorkshire that was in a very poor area, was underperforming badly, um, a new head teacher 
thought maybe the arts could play a role in our school in raising the aspiration of the children and helping them see that they can do much more than they think they can. So she contacted a couple of artists, including one Mary Robson, who worked on the project for uh, nearly the following 10 years. Um, what Mary did was set up an art room, which was a permanent space to which children could come at any time and in which they made up their own rules for how it would operate. One of the things they particularly worked on was their own personal self-portraits and you can see a child working on that there. This was some of what Mary told me when I spoke to her last year. They allowed the children, encouraged the children to take responsibility for the managing of, of the art room and very soon the atmosphere in the, in the school changed and it became much more productive. The children were starting to be more attentive in school. One of the problems though that, that the, te the head teacher had noticed was there was still a lot of anxiety about the move from the primary school to the secondary school. And so the idea came to create this special carnival procession from the school, the, the primary school, up to the secondary school, which was about a mile away. And it became a completely magical, beautiful, but very powerful community ritual. For months beforehand, the Year 6 children would create sculptures that represented some of their hopes and fears about moving into the secondary school. And then the procession walked up from the primary school to the secondary school. Their parents would come out of their houses and follow and when they reached the secondary school the head teacher came out and would welcome the children and the sculptures would be taken into the school hall and welcomed and kept there and then everybody walked down including the uh, parents and the teachers from the secondary school to see the exhibition in the primary school of the work that the children had done. And I particularly like this uh, quote from one of the children who was involved talking about the self-portraits uh, that they had made. On the one hand, this is a very simple project that artistically is childlike, one could say. But at the same time, I find it a deeply moving, deeply important uh, expression of a community taking care of its, of its children and trying to protect the hope that is invested in them in that change from primary school to secondary school. That it represents to me to some extent the kind of way in which this work has become so normal, so everyday. And the last thing that I will show you here to, to round up this overview of the, the history you remember I mentioned Joan Littlewood and her idea of the fun palaces, which she never managed to build. She had some plans drawn up and she kept meeting with politicians and councillors and nobody would ever back it. In uh, 2013, a woman called Stella Duffy, who's a theatre maker and a novelist, stood up at a theatre conference and said, 
Who wants to help me celebrate the centenary of Joan Littlewood's birth? The centenary of Joan Littlewood's birth was in October 2014. And what they decided to do was to create fun palaces as temporary moments of artistic creativity. And they just invited people to do it. They said, if you want to do a fun palace, here's the idea, here's some stuff about how to market it, here's some uh, ideas of what you might do, it's up to you. In 2014, 138 fun palaces were made by 3,000 people. Each of them was a temporary thing, sometimes an afternoon, sometimes a weekend. By 2017, there were 362 fun palaces made by 13,750 people with 126,000 participants. All of that with virtually no public money, no public organisation, no institutional support, simply because people feel, believe, know that they have the potential to be creative, they have the potential to do things that matter to them in their own community, and they have the energy and the desire to do it. And what Fun Palaces as a movement gives them is the permission and the encouragement just to get on and do it. That's what I mean by the normalisation of participatory art in the time that I have been uh, working in it. So, thank you for your attention. I suggest we take a, a 15 minute break now and then we'll, I'll talk more about what it is now and some of the theoretical questions for you after we've had a chance to stretch our legs. But if there's anything uh, anybody wanted to ask, yes. separate. It's not because I don't value it. On the contrary, I, I think amateur art is, is an immensely rich and valuable um, aspect of our cultural life. Um, the reason it may become a bit clearer when, in a moment when I talk about um, participatory art as a form, I think that when, amateur, when amateurs are making theatre, there is no meaningful difference between what they are doing and what professionals are doing when they are making theatre. They're, they're both engaged in the same process of making theatre, using the same techniques and tools and ideas. It happens that the professionals are probably better trained and they're certainly paid, and the amateurs are not, but sometimes the amateur performers are are better, frankly, than some professional performers that I've seen. But they're essentially doing the same thing. They are making theatre. And the fact that some are amateur and some are not is kind of irrelevant. It's the same with, with singers, choirs. You can have an amateur choir, you can have a... There are very few professional choirs, but you could have a professional choir. Um, 
But essentially what they're doing is making the music, they are interpreting. But I can't see a meaningful difference between those two groups. The only difference is their, their status within the art world. What I'm saying, participatory art is different because of that bringing together of amateurs and non-professionals to make something which didn't already exist. And I, this may come clearer when we're in, the, in the, the second half when I talk more about the theories and the ideas that underpin community art for me. Yes? Um, I would have an objection of the other exclusion, but I'm, exclusion, but I'm not going to go there. That's there. another story. But I wanted to ask about the, the historical part. Um, you didn't talk about town artists, so I was wondering if you include them in the community art uh, history in a way, and, and then um, other sort of uh, neighboring uh, activities that I could see would be some feminist artist groups or black arts movement and the film collectives and such. And I understand that you, when you make a sort of presentation in a short time, you definitely need to choose some <coughs> things. And, and it was very clear. And thank you very much for the sort of step by step, very clear, um, taking us through their history. But I was wondering if you, how you see this. Um, I think there are there are lots of routes. The the, the town artist. Um, the, the town artist is kind of, it's certainly on the edges of community arts, and some of them worked as community artists, others didn't. It's somewhere between artists in residence, um, which was also a big uh, one of the strands. So you could talk about the artist placement group as being another of the antecedents of community arts, because they were the first people to go into workplaces. But I don't think they were community artists, they were contemporary artists working in different contexts. So there are a number of strands that one could bring. Um, the feminist thing is interesting. My, my wife was in a, a feminist collective called Visible Women, and she was, as it happens, also a community artist. But at the same time, I think the Visible Women were not community artists. They were a feminist art collective in the uh, working in a contemporary art idiom. So there are all of these, all of these um, different uh, strands that come in, into it. Um, but I think they, well, you'll see when we, we talk, the boundaries are certainly blurred. Uh, and it's not, you know, when you're trying to make a presentation or an analysis, you inevitably uh, tidy things up a bit. To, to make it possible. Yes, did you? Yes. Uh, how would you define artists who do participatory work in art institutions, engaging maybe other professional artists and then maybe art administrators? I think. Would you include them in? in I think you'd have, I think I would have, I, I would look at it on a, on a, a, a case by case basis. I think some of it may be participatory art, some of it, perhaps the majority of it is more contemporary artists using participation as a method. The, for me the real, the real test is whether the artist is genuinely willing to share some measure of control and authorship, or whether the, the work is actually um, an authored work by the artist, in which other people are invited to participate. Um, it's a, for me, that's a, that's a different kind of practice. I'm, and again, I'm not making a judgment about it. You can admire or find that work very interesting and important or not. <coughs> In all of this, what I think, the reason these definitions matter to me and these, these boundaries matter to me is because I think it, it really matters that you understand and are clear about what you're doing. 
because if you don't, then I think you are in danger of misleading the people you work with. You can create false expectations, you can imply promises that you're not willing to actually carry out. So you ha I think you have to, to be clear in your own mind about that. Sure. Do you have any English, another word uh, for people who are dealing with arts uh, but not living all of that? I'm sorry, and say Do you have another word uh, which could be a synonym for amateur art but maybe have another bit, another connotation? They are people who are uh, dealing, dealing with arts because they love to do it. They do it on the basis of uh, their own resources. They are not living on it. So because it's amateur art, it has kind of that. Uh, the, uh, about um, 25 years ago, uh, there was a, um, an effort to rebrand amateur art as voluntary art. Um, and there is now an organisation called Voluntary Art England and it has counterparts in, a, in the other countries of the UK uh, and some people prefer to talk about voluntary arts um, I, and I understand why because amateur for some people has um, uh, unhappy associations and it's seen to be condescending um, I don't have strong feelings about those things I, I think people should call themselves what they what they want to, and I'm not. I don't even have strong feelings about what people who work in participatory arts call themselves. They can describe their work as socially engaged or any of the other things that are meaningful to them. What I'm trying to do in all of this work that I'm outlining today is to map a landscape and understand how it works, even if. Uh, it's somewhat unstable. Let me let me move on a little bit with because some of what I'm going to, to talk about, I hope might answer uh, some of these questions. So uh, this is an important thing that I, I've been thinking about quite a lot for quite a long time, and I now I think I know what I what I think about it. So. I now would say that participatory art is a form, although the term form is, the reason I'm slightly hesitant is because form is not actually quite right, but because we talk about art forms like music or theatre, it's a form in that sense, in the sense that it is, it is not a different way of doing another form. In other words, community theatre is a form of participatory art. It is not a form of theatre done differently. Um, and I've chosen this example to illustrate what I mean. This is from a, 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 um, a still from a, a very good film called High Hopes by Mike Lee. Mike Lee uh, is a British theatre and more recently film director who uh, is, is well known for developing his scripts in improvisation with the actors. Um, and it's often been a much admired process. And that, to me, is a theatre or a filmmaker using participation as a method, and in this case, doing it extremely well and empowering the actors that he works with, who are usually generally professional people, um, uh, in that process. But in the end, he is a filmmaker or a theatre maker. He's not a participatory artist in that context. And this is why, or this is part of why. This is an image from um, a production that I saw about a year ago in Rotterdam by a group called Fada Theatre. Uh, it was a production, uh, it was in Arabic, had nine performers, all of whom 
were asylum seekers in uh, the Netherlands, all of them Syrian. And the, the piece was about some of their experiences and their reasons for leaving Syria in the Civil War and their journey across the Mediterranean. Um, now, I think that it was impossible as a spectator to not be aware that you were watching somebody who had lived through the experiences that were being turned into theatre. And because of that, it changed everything about that as an artistic experience. It's one thing to watch a professional performer imitating a Syrian refugee. It is something completely different watching a Syrian refugee make art out of their experience. And the point is they're making art. This is not, this is not simply witnessing. Witnessing is what happens in a courtroom. People stand up and say what happened to them. This was not literal. Some of the stories in, in their play belong to people who are no longer in the company because they met in an asylum seeker centre. They now, the current performers have all been granted asylum, so they're no longer placed there. Some of the people who worked with them no longer want to do theatre. They talked to me about a dentist whose story is in the play, but now he's he wanted to do it while he was there, while he was trapped in the Asylum Seeker Centre, while he had something to say, to try and work out, and theatre gave him the medium to do that. But now, thank you very much, he wants to get on with his life and try and get some work and, and be a dentist again. Who knows? This is what I mean about how non-professional artists can make art that is as powerful, as remarkable, as professional artists, but different. It's different because their reasons for making it are different. They are often driven by particular situations or experiences that they have, that they are trying to find meaning in or to communicate to other people about because they are so important and they're using art for that purpose. But it's also different because actually sometimes it's a really creative thing not to know what is the proper way to do something. The limitations of being a professional artist is you think, okay, I know how to perform this, I know how to draw that. Somebody who doesn't know those things may actually do it in a radically surprising and interesting and powerful way that communicates completely differently. And that is what I think I saw in this performance. The next couple of images are also from the same performance. And I've been thinking a lot about um, this idea, which comes from the uh, Swiss-German philosopher, Karl Jaspers. Um, he talks about border situations. Situations where, existential situations, where we are confronted by things that challenge our existing way of making the world, making sense of the world. Things that we cannot uh, take for granted. That we have to take the responsibility of how we act in those situations. And I think that I find this a really helpful way of understanding why participatory art is different. Because it is always a border situation. It always brings together uh, people from different fields, most obviously in the professional and non-professional artists, but often because there may be uh, people, as you've seen in some of the historical work, people from social services or from education or from urban regeneration, people who have other intentions and other purposes as to why this work should be happening. And as a result, this is one of the reasons why this work, to me, remains so alive, so energised, so interesting, because you can't ever simply say, this is what it is, okay, I've seen that, I know what it is, I'm comfortable with that. It makes you uncomfortable all the time. 
I'm watching these uh, uh, Syrian artists tell their story, enact their situation from the comfortable seats of a Dutch theatre is a deeply uncomfortable situation in any sense that you can imagine. And it is differently uncomfortable than if it had been a performance done by uh, um, professional artists who were reenacting that. And that, I think, goes for all of participatory art. Now, what I, uh, I touched on this yesterday in the workshop, and I'm going to give you a, a, a fuller and, and I hope better explanation, um, which is about the intentions that people bring to this. And the fact that those intentions are not the same and consequently they create those border situations. Um, so I think participatory art is, is better understood by looking at people's intentions in doing it than at questions of form or policy or culture or practice. And that's more difficult because we, we tend to look at things by external forms or by concepts like, is someone an amateur or not? Whereas actually, I think it's more useful to look at why are people doing this at all? Um, so those of you who were here yesterday will know that I believe there are three broad intentions. Um, the first, the most common, which is also to some extent the most ancient, is the access to culture. Those mechanics institutes that I showed you from the 19th century were about working people seizing for themselves access to culture because they recognise culture is a force for development, of a force for our own education and change and growth and development. Um, in the, since we have had the welfare state, that what was being seized by working people for themselves is now being offered by the welfare state to working people. So once we invented public funding of culture, which happened after the Second World War, as in the context of a welfare state, the principal justification for spending taxpayers' money on culture was that everybody could and should benefit from it. In truth, as all the data shows, that most publicly funded, uh, uh, most publicly funded cultural provision in the UK is accessed by a small minority, sometimes as low as 10% of the population. Here in Finland it may be different, but that's the case, it's, a, it's also the case in France. Relatively small proportions, and that proportion tends to be, not surprisingly, the better educated, um, the better off members of society. In other words, the ones who are closest to those elite ideas of fine arts that structure our cultural institutions. So the response has generally been to provide programs to encourage people or to enable people to have access to culture they wouldn't otherwise have. Some of those programs uh, are good, some of them are remarkable. Some of them have a lot of problems. Because one of the, the underlying problem I think that they have is they implicitly tell people that what they currently like and do is not good enough. That they should be interested in things that they're not already interested in. Um, but sometimes the work is very good. This is from a, a, a great program. This image is from a great program from the Philharmonie de Paris, which for about six, seven years now has been doing really very careful work uh, uh, introducing young people from deprived neighborhoods to um, uh, orchestral music and playing. And they now have something, I, last time I checked, they have 13 different youth orchestras across Paris and other parts of France that are changing lives and introducing young people uh, to art and giving them access. 
The second big area is social change. This is a, an image from Geese Theatre, uh, which is based in Birmingham, um, who work exclusively in the criminal justice system. Uh, in order to do that, because the criminal justice system really isn't interested in offering, uh, in Britain, it is really not interested in offering uh, prisoners the opportunity to take part in theatre or arts activity unless they can be shown to have some effect on that person's future and uh, rehabilitation. So you can see this, the comment there is from the mission statement of Geese Theatre. So this is not about making theatre, it's about using theatre and drama to enable choice, personal responsibility and change. Um, it is a very clear intention uh, to bring about um, social change. The third uh, intention is the one that is least well, well understood. Um, it emerged, the, the concept of cultural democracy emerged in the 1970s, in fact in a conference in Oslo um, of European minister, Ministers of Culture that took place in 1976 and was organised by the Council of Europe. And that was the first time that Ministers of Culture, for a variety of reasons, began to recognise that access to culture was an inadequate cultural policy. And cultural democracy came, they coined the phrase uh, then, uh, and began to consider how their cultural policies could enable people to take part in the cultural life of the nation on their own terms, how it was possible to validate and value what people already did. These phrases are from a draft charter of the Campaign for Cultural Democracy that was uh, an initiative in the UK that was uh, drawn up in 1984 and was one of the things that eventually split the community arts movement and led to the, to the winding up of the National Association for Community Artists. So the, uh, this, I like this, these phrase, I, I won't read them all out, but they're, they're very direct and they explain to people in lang or they, they can be understood by people in language that I think is really quite clear. Today, cultural democracy is starting to become fashionable again in the British discourse, but it is being used, as far as I see, in, to mean something rather different. It is being used to validate what is sometimes called everyday participation, or all the things that people already do. Um, in a kind of depoliticized sense. There isn't a purpose behind it. And I question it because I'm not sure that the, the cultural activities that people already do, from uh, hip hop to knitting, um, require any validation from anybody except the people who do it. I think it's rather condescending to think that somehow if academia or government goes around praising what people already do culturally, somehow uh, the situation has changed or people's lives have been improved. This is what I mean by cultural democracy um, in, in action, if you like. This is an image that, I, if you remember, I showed you some images before from a project I worked on that I said were, were made by patients of a large psychiatric hospital that was closing and they, they were now being uh, forced in effect, they didn't have a choice, they had to leave and they, their care would now be in the community. The policy was called care in the community, they would live in the community. Um, and we worked for 18 months with, with people on both within the hospital and outside to help them reflect on and to some extent, by reflecting on it and making art about it, at least take some control over a situation in which they had no control at all. And two books were published and uh, an exhibition was uh, created and toured nationally. And eventually it, 
symbolically, we managed to get the exhibition uh, installed in the foyer of the Department of Health, where the, the decision to close the hospitals were taken as a national policy dis decision. Um, the reason this image means a lot to me, um, well, there's a number of reasons, but I'll just, I'll just explain. Okay, it's made by uh, a man called Simon Piercy, who I haven't seen uh, now for since 1990. Um, he did a lot of work in the, in the project. If you remember on the last slide where I showed you some others, his was also the image of a typewriter with a knife and fork on either side of it. Um, and he wrote a lot of poems, some of which I find very powerful and moving. Um, I think this is a very sophisticated image. It's called Still Life with Key. Um, so, I'll tell you what I see in it. I see the fragility of life outside the psychiatric hospital. There are symbols of things that you don't get when you're uh, incarcerated in a psychiatric hospital. A key, money, alcohol. I think it's not an accident that one of the cans of alcohol is on its side. I think it's very specially not an accident that the alcohol, the brand of alcohol is called Trent Bitter given that the health authority that ran the hospital was Trent Health Authority. And I think it's not an accident that this image is called Still Life with Key and is aesthetically very beautiful and consequently is placed within a tradition of artistic still life. To me, this is what cultural democracy is trying to achieve, to enable people to make art to the best of their ability, and in Simon's case, I think, to a very high ability, that says, this is who I am. This is what makes sense to me in, in the world. This is what I value. This is what I want to tell you. And it is particularly, radically important when you are talking about people who are marginalised by the rest of society. People whose voices are precisely not heard, not listened to. People who are written about, who never write their own version of reality. And that was very much the case of people with mental health problems at the time of the closure of the hospitals. There was a significant hostile press coverage of their move into the community. And so, when I say this is one of the most political projects I've been involved in, that's what I mean. Because it is consciously about trying to help people who are unheard, and whose unheardness means that they are on the receiving end of policies and actions from others that may well disadvantage them or worse. It's about giving those people an opportunity to be part of that democratic space which we call our cultural life. So yesterday I showed you that I think these three uh, intentions are not incompatible. They are overlapping fields of work that define a kind of border territory that keeps that instability there always, that uh, prevents anybody from feeling they know quite how to do this and what's the right answer, because within the group of people who are doing this, other people don't agree with them and have slightly different interpretations and understandings and professional disciplines and perspectives and desires out of what they are doing. Um, now, I want to, as a, in the last part of this, 
to talk a little bit about the difference between participatory art and community art. But before I do, let me just ask if there's any questions that people have or comments that you want to make about these intentions that I've just outlined. Yeah. Can you just specify, because you hold it very important that there are professional artists and non-professional artists working together in order to define that uh, as better art. So, for example, in the last picture, what, where was that connection? I the that. Simon, Simon worked with uh, a professional photographer, a man called Ross Boyd, who was the photographer in residence on that project. And actually, Ross and the, the patients uh, and former patients of the hospital, I, I don't think they made 60 photographs in the space of 15 months that he worked with them. Most of his time was spent one-to-one -one just being with them, talking to them, gaining their trust, exploring with them what they wanted to do. Ross had extraordinarily rigorous discipline as a photographer. He's died a few years ago, sadly. He was a good friend. And if that photograph is as sophisticated as it is, it's because Ross was both technically a very accomplished photographer and printmaker and a, a gifted person at working with somebody else to help them create the work that they wanted to make. But it's Simon's image, absolutely. It's not Ross's. Ross's work doesn't look anything like that. That clarifies it, but don't you then think that, that both names should perhaps be mentioned when a picture is shown so that this aspect becomes clear? Yes, I, 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 should, I should certainly have, you're right, I, it, I should have mentioned Ross's name in the context of, of that work. In, it's probably habit, in the, when they were published in, in the book and in the exhibition, the name of the writer and, and, and the photographer who had worked on them were on the cover as being the writers and, and the writer and photographer, the artists who'd worked on the project. And then each poem or photograph had the maker's name on it. So I probably just picked up that habit from there. But you're right, it's, it's a, it is a joint production and it should have both their names credited. Okay. One of the things that, one of the reasons that made me struggle for a long time with deciding to use the, the term participatory art is because I had lived through that time of when community art became participatory arts with an S. Um, and I, I didn't like that change. I thought it was politically and conceptually, theoretically, uh, questionable. But I think the term participatory art, as I've said, is a useful portmanteau term because it can hold so many things. What's difficult now, though, <coughs> and the other reason that I struggled with it, is because uh, Community art today is one small part of a much bigger field called participatory art. That's okay as far as it goes, but you have to remember that community art came first. So my, my metaphor for trying to explain this is that you can think of community art as a, as a mountain spring relatively small and uh, uh, fast and clear and it's gradually as it's uh, with time it has gradually flowed and become a big wide river possibly even a delta if I stretch my metaphor further um, which is now broad and includes many kinds of things called many that have many different names but, and community art is still there so, but I still think the difference is important. I'm, it's the one distinction that I think is worth making. And I completely recognize that is 
simply my own prejudice, because it's where I come from and what I believe in. Um, so, here is a definition of community art. And this is more complex than, the, than what you've just seen as a definition of participatory art. So, community art is the creation of art as a human right by professional and non-professional artists operating as equals for purposes and to standards that they set together and whose processes, products and outcomes cannot be known in advance. And what I want to do now is just talk you through some of the ideas to explain why I have included all of that language. So, first of all, as a human right. Uh, you may be familiar with Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It gives us all the right to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts, among other things. It goes on. But those are key ideas to me. Um, so what I'm saying, I think, Community art believes that this is a right. This is not something that is graciously given to us through an act of cultural policy or the uh, outreach work of a cultural institution. It is everyone's right to be part, to participate in the cultural life of the community in exactly the way that I think we enabled Simon Piercy to do by enabling him to not only make poetry and images, but by publishing them and distributing them and in a way that they were the equal of the work of professional artists. They were seen and understood and could be responded to in that way. Um, and this is, a, this is a, an example of some of that in action. This is a, um, these are images from prison work by uh, an organization called Movement for Expressive Photography, um, uh, in, which is based in Lisbon, in Portugal. They're a remarkable uh, group of people who have been working since about 2002, often with very little money, they do a lot of training in photography, teaching, which people pay for, and that enables them to do some other work. These images are from a project in a prison where they worked with young offenders. They got the young offenders to make pinhole cameras of their own design, cardboard pinhole cameras, and then they were able to go out, you can see them uh, taking photographs of things that mattered to them, the photographs are then printed up for them and they made notebooks in which they could uh, talk, write about what the photograph meant to them, why it was important. They could begin to reflect on who they were. These, these are teenagers who have very rarely been given the chance to ask themselves questions the way that an artist does about who am I? What matters to me? How can I communicate that? And the final image shows the exhibition of the images um, that, that were chosen, some of them. Their meth is very rigorous about the, the work they're doing. So it seems to me they are fulfilling that sense of seeing this work as a human right. They are going into a closed institution and saying, yes, you young people have the same right to use art in that powerful way that fine art invented of being self-critical, being consciously meaning-making, being uh, interfering with the, with the cultural uh, norms of your society and your time, of asking yourself questions and sharing that with others. So, uh, I think it's a, it's a characteristic example of some of the best of community artwork today. Um, 
sorry, I should have said at the beginning, I'm not going to go back over the creation of art and the professional and non-professional artists because we've done that. So, cooperating as equals. I think this, again, is another critical thing. And it, it's more of a mindset. One of the things, one of the, the things that I think doesn't happen often in when contemporary art is doing participatory art or using participation is a genuine sense that everybody in the room is an equal. And this is a, another project. This is one of, uh, again, one of my favorite projects. It's, it's an extraordinary story. So the person uh, with the slightly wild hair and glasses and the white shirt is called Marcus Hammond. And he's an artist, studied at Goldsmiths. He lives in Gainsborough, which is a small town, uh, rather isolated town in eastern England, uh, an industrial town that is, has hit hard times. Uh, ten years ago, he bought this church, uh, which the, the, had been deconsecrated and was just put on sale uh, for, I think it cost £70,000. Uh, the church didn't want it anymore. He and his wife, Hilary, had already created a gallery and studio spaces in another part of town, and he thought he could use this. Um, and he began to think of a programme of um, contemporary artworks and installations and how artists would respond to this space. The church is in one of the poorest parts of Gainsborough, which is one of the, and the ward it's in is one of the, the very poorest districts of the whole of the UK. And very quickly he learned that although he might be the owner of the church, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the law might see him as the owner of the church. Actually, the people who lived around there had a slightly more complicated idea. They kind of thought it was their church. He was, I think they, they probably just saw him as the latest vicar, because vicars come and go, you know, outsiders who come in and do things. Very quickly, he learned that there were restrictions on what he could do in the place. And he had to begin to work with local people. The first installation, the first artist he, he, um, he brought in uh, was a, a German artist called Klaus, Claudia Pilsel. And together, when they took over the church, they found a whole lot of old photographs of community celebrations that had happened around there. And in fact, her work then began, she began to interview local people. And she made a couple of video films that were there. But what really happened, well, before even that uh, went on, when the people, when the kids had found out the church had been sold, they had a lot of fun throwing stones through the windows. And during the first summer that Marcus had it, he had to repair about 5,000 window panes. And while he was working there, the kids would kept, keep coming in, because it was the summer holidays and they didn't have anywhere to go or anything to do. And he found himself providing them with balls and orange juice and running a kind of informal youth club. Ten years later, the church is a genuinely shared project. This is uh, an art uh, exhibition opening one night, being visited by a mix of contemporary art people and local people. Um, the, the only funding the church gets is there's a part-time mental health worker. So all those people that you saw in the first picture in the cafe are all volunteers. That cafe is open six days a week and on Saturdays it provides free food that comes from the supermarkets. Um, it has become an extraordinary space of cultural democracy which is used by different people in different ways 
for their own purposes. And uh, one of the most salient things that happens there, it's used as a rehearsal space by local kids. They keep all their equipment there. This is uh, an, uh, one of their um, gigs in the church. But he also told me that um, after the Bataclan massacre, a lot of the kids locally felt very moved and touched by it because they also listened to the Eagles of Death Metal. And uh, they had a, um, a ceremony, an evening, where they invited people. As you can see, it's on the Thursday after the, after the weekend. They just in, opened the church and invited people. And, so in a, and they played records as it says, loud. Um, and about 200 people were there. And to me, it's a kind of symbolic of the, actually this strange project, which is both a community mental health facility, a youth club, uh, a, a, a food bank for poor uh, people, a social space, and an art centre, showing some quite challenging contemporary art is also a kind of secular church because this ritual is the kind of thing that would have been happening if the church itself uh, was still using it for, for religious purposes. So the point about all of this story is that this has only been made possible because Marcus Hammond recognises that everybody in that church has their own space, has their equal right to say what's going to happen. This is a place where there is both immigration from Eastern Europe and uh, support for hard-right anti-immigration political parties. And both of those people on both of those positions meet in the space that the church offers and have to listen to each other. And that, I think, is integral to what community arts is about. For purposes and to standards that they set together, to some extent you could say this flows out of the sense of equality. But this is a challenge to quite a lot of the policy that shapes participatory art today. Because actually the purposes and standards of many participatory art projects are set in municipal buildings or in foundations, in negotiation with artists who say, we're going to do this project and it will have this positive social outcome. And that is often not shared with the people who are supposed to benefit and experience that social outcome. So there is a kind of um, part of the discourse about community art, part of the pushback from people with more um, conservative views of what art is and should be, is the idea that art can be instrumentalized. It shouldn't be instrumentalized. It should serve only the purpose of art. I think that's a naive and uh, questionable idea which is often actually put in bad faith because all art serves purposes of one kind or another. When, uh, when a commercial sponsor gives money to a gallery or to an opera house, it's not because they love art, it's so that they can invite their clients to come to the reception and show how uh, what a good image they have in the local area. So that is also a form of instrumentalization. But what the instrumentalization that concerns me more is the instrumentalization of people. People are the end. They should never be the means. That's what instrumentalization actually means. It means using something for a purpose that it was not intended for. People are what should not be used. And that is why I think that if you construct a project that is intended to have an effect on people that they are not aware of, that they have not agreed to, 
you are in effect instrumentalizing them. You are making them a means towards some kind of better vision of society that you have decided is what should happen. And that, I think, community arts would not accept and stands against. So, in a good community arts project, the reason why a project is happening, its intentions, and the, the point at which its goals will be met, which is what I mean by the standards, are things that are negotiated together. This is a, a very interesting project from South London called Meet Me at the Albany, which happens in a community stroke art centre. It's a, uh, in um, Deptford in South East London. It is now a weekly arts and social club, <coughs> one, one might say, for elderly people, for independent elderly people who come, pay some money into the, into the, the, the kitty for the, they get lunch, they get tea. This is not a social services organized thing. It, some of the funding for it comes from social services but it is something which is determined and run by the people themselves. They do a range of artistic activities. They do craft work, they do circus. You haven't seen anything until you've seen a 60-year-old on a trapeze. They do theatre, they do painting, and it changes because of what they want. So they've done film nights, they go out on films. They determine for themselves what is meaningful to them. And it is always negotiated by the people together, the artists, the professional artists, and the, the people who use the activity. And ultimately, the last bit, that the processes, the products, and the outcomes cannot be known in advance. One of the reasons that I don't think Spencer Tunick's work is participatory art, and certainly not community art, is because he knows exactly what will happen, how it will happen, and what he will walk away with. Because the people who are taking part in that are simply, as I've said before, materials. If you are working in a border situation, if you are working with professionals and non-professionals, by definition, you cannot know what is going to happen. If you think you do know what is going to happen, then you are simply making other people jump through hoops. You are simply, you have pre-planned everything and they are simply obeying your orders, in effect, to put it no more uh, fancily than that. So, that for me is the big challenge of community art and that makes it very difficult to get funding for it, honestly, because you have to say, I can't tell you whether we'll be able to make a play at the end of this. We hope we will, but actually maybe once we get started people will say we want to make a video instead because a play was a stupid idea, because I thought it was a good idea at the beginning, but actually now we've talked about it, we want to do something completely different. Unless you're prepared to go with people where they want to go, then I think you can't do good work. But at the same time, if you're a professional, I am not saying that you are simply at the service of other people. The, the point about uh, cooperating as equals runs both ways. As a professional artist, you have the right to say, okay, you want to make a video, but actually that's not me. You need to find another artist to do that with you because I don't know how to do that. I'm not interested in videos. I don't like video. It's not what I do. You have your own boundaries. You're a professional and you're able to say, this is what I can do. So you, there's as much respect for you as an artist working in that context as there is for anyone else. The balance has to be equal on both sides. And this is an example of a project which is, does live up to that sense of, of not knowing uh, what's going to happen. It's a project from Kaunas in Lithuania 
uh, undertaken by a, a group of people, including uh, an Irishman who now lives there called Ed Carroll uh, and his partner, uh, who's Lithuanian. This is a, um, a project that they've called the Cabbage Field, and it's, a, it's an old military site in the, in the town, in, the, in their neighborhood, which is kind of derelict, and they're gradually trying to find ways of returning it into public use and creating, uh, making people able to feel they can come and, and use it and uh, begin negotiations with the, the council about its future. This was an event they did um, uh, last November with shadow puppets and films uh, being shown on the, on the space. I think they would say even now they don't know where this is going, what it will happen, what will happen, because there are lots of people involved and working with it, and they are having to negotiate in this border territory, this literal border territory of a cabbage field that has been used for allotments, has been used for military use, doesn't have a future, but has lots of people eyeing it with different ideas about it. So. That's, for me, the more radical, more challenging, more demanding uh, uh, bit, the uh, practice that I would call community art. I'll just finish by returning to where I started with the idea that uh, participatory art has become normal in my working lifetime. I think that it is all of it all of these things has all these characteristics um, and it is important not to romanticize it or idealize it uh, it has lots of failures it has lots of pitfalls and traps but it can be remarkable and very exciting but above all it is now becoming normal this is a chart that shows the uh, rise of uh, primary education uh, in different countries in the world. In, uh, in the UK, the first Education Act was passed in 1870. At the time, there were still politicians who stood up in Parliament and opposed the idea that all children should be educated. They thought that it would give them ideas above their station, they were only going to work in factories, what was the point of enabling them to read and write? It was very wrong. Um, that idea now strikes us as absurd. I think that during the course of my lifetime, we are starting to see the end of that split that began in the Enlightenment between fine art, the, what the elite could value, and what everybody else did and valued. But crucially, we are not returning to a place, to a time before the Enlightenment, because fine art was a very powerful thing. We don't want to throw that away and its capacity to make us see the world differently and to innovate and to be so creative. What we do want to do is to make that available to everyone as a right, accepting that that is what a cultural democracy will be. And I think that that is happening. That has been happening in my working life. And I'll just leave you with this final metaphor. I think we often feel, those of us who work in this field, who still feel marginalised and underappreciated and that it's hard to raise the money and we're required to do uh, jump through all sorts of sorts of hoops. Um, I think we can be buffeted by the waves and the wind because we're on the surface of things. But the tide is going our way. The tide has been going our way since the Second World War. <coughs> more and more people feel empowered and enabled and happy to use art for their own purposes, on their own terms, and to talk about it and feel confident about it and to engage with it. And 
I'm very glad of that and I hope that it continues, I believe it will continue to happen for people so that we get to a point where we do eventually have a cultural democracy and maybe at that time we won't need to distinguish between community art and participatory art and all the other forms of art. We'll just have art for everyone. Thank you very much. This one? Yes. Uh, so, uh, this is 1820. This is the percentage of the total population that has education to primary level. And each of the lines is a different country. So this is Niger, uh, and this is France. So, one is from France, the first one. So from about 1860, 100% of the population is educated to primary level. And what is the United Kingdom is which one? Sorry? Which one is United Kingdom? Uh, which one it's red? this purple one here. This one that goes up nearly as quickly as France, but it only becomes 100% about 1900. Because the 1870 Education Act was only an enabling act. It didn't force local authorities to provide education, it just allowed them to. Is it here mentioned also Germany, for example, or, or Eastern Europe, some countries? No? Uh, there, there aren't all of the countries there because it would then become an impossible chart to read. But you can, I found this on a website called Our World in Data, which is an interesting source of statistical data. You see in the top corner, Our World in Data? Yes. So you you can find. What what, what is the, the, the source? I'm very really interested in that. One of those. It's a disadvantage of sitting at the back. Yes. are absolutely correct. Um, the, this definition is something that I, I worked out in the last 18 months or so. I wouldn't say it's definitive. I think I'd probably think that where um, the, the point about, um, sorry, let me go back. Well, I guess it's part of equality. <coughs> I think it, it would be covered in my mind by cooperating as equals that if you that implies a mutuality of respect uh, if you are working together as equals but and whilst I, I could put more in I'd rather take stuff out um, the strength of my other definition of participatory art is it short enough to remember this one sadly isn't uh, but it would be good if I could come up with a definition that was. Do you see that the difference between arts education and uh, participatory art is in the goals? Uh, to some extent it's in the goals. Um, the education, art education can be brilliant. Uh, I'm not at all uh, disparaging it. One of its differences between most participatory and, and community art is that uh, the goal is, is personal development. Yeah? Um, so it's not about creating an artwork. It's not about uh, 
communicating something to, to the world. It's not an act of making something in the world. The other the, uh, big difference is that it tends to be individual. Uh, our education rightly is individual because we're all different and we both learn differently and we have different aspirations, we, we have different interests. And so uh, how it functions has to place a much greater uh, emphasis on, on the person. Whereas the strength of community and participatory art, I think, is often that it is uh, collective or shared. It's a group activity. And there's a time when it's, there are times and situations when individual things are very good for us. There are also times when actually being part of a group where we are asked to do things we wouldn't expect to do, where also our weaknesses might be compensated by other people's strengths are important too. So it, for me, it's not a um, one is better than the other. It's just that they're different. <laughs> yes. You, you talked about creating border situations, and, mm. uh, and you referred to a particular theatre piece where you mm. said that, that as the participants had a immigrant background, refugee background, that created a particular sort of a quality in the performance that would not be achieved with professional actors. It's actually something that, that the National Theatre in Finland did just uh, this autumn with, with uh, uh, the other home performers. Yes. Uh, now, have, how does the idea of border situation uh, come in terms with the concept, does it come in terms with the concept of, of hybrid contexts or hy hybrid spaces or, or, or the third space that the public talks about? Is there some resonance with that? The third space that who talked about? Homing, 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 homing. Okay, right. I, I'm he, not familiar he's enough. He's sort of about, talked sorry. about the third space as sort of a, uh, two or more cultures coming together and is trying to establish a sort of a egalitarian space where the preconceived ideas are being left outside and the new rules of the situation are sort of renegotiated in that situation okay. and that enables new ideas to emerge. I think that there certainly is some, some parallels with that. Um, it is, the example I used was, was a, a cross-cultural um, thing, but it, I think it, could, it happens just as much, for instance, in the field of art and health where you, you have people cooperating who have quite different intentions. The, the health uh, provider is concerned with people's quality of life or, or whether there may even be a, a direct health uh, improvement. And the artist is concerned with, with uh, making something that is satisfying artistically. And then the participants may even have a, a, an entirely separate uh, set of expectations. Um, and they also have, in a sense, have to make a third space from their, their separate cultures when they, they come together. Uh, and, and that is where they are crossing borders. They're always having to be not only in their own safe space. Okay, when I'm in, uh, in my health field and we're talking to other health people and we all understand each other. That's where the restlessness and the difficulty comes in. And it, it jolts us and keeps us alive because you can't have that sometimes the complacency that we have when we're in our own field, only talking to people who already share our assumptions and, and so on. That was what I had in mind. So that's also the being, being on the verge of or, 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 or sort of approaching what is not known or approaching the unknown or that they're not yet known. Perhaps. Yes. Yes, and that, that also then brings us back to the, to the last point in my definition, which is that we accept what will come out of this creative process cannot be known. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> yeah, of course. But Of what, of what, of what 
depends what the what the funder thinks they're buying. You know, if the funder thinks they're buying a piece of theatre, then maybe you should be careful about what you promise. But if the funder thinks that they're they're buying a community arts project that will last for six months and involve all of these people and something will come out of it, then you can guarantee that that will happen. Yeah. You just, it's about, and to be honest, my experience funders are not that interested in, in specifics. They won't come and see the play. They just want to know what you've done. Isn't it so that by definition, created by an artistic processes are. I mean, they're supposed to be something, but you don't know what comes out of it. That, <laughs> that is true. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not sure, yeah. I'm not sure how often in practice yeah. mainstream yeah. professional yeah. art fulfills that criterion. Yeah. <coughs> you know? That's the idea. I think the rhetoric is there, but it's one of the reasons that I think community art is often so much more uh, energised and, and risky in a good way, you know, because often you really don't know what's going to happen, whether it will work. <coughs> Whereas, you know, if you're running a, a repertory theatre and you know your play is going, is opening on the 3rd of June, well, it will open on the 3rd of June. The only bit you can't know is whether it will be any good. Yeah. But who will be these people, either non-professional or professional? What, 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 do you have a special uh, um, education system for is preparing these kind of people? What, what or, I, be, or it isn't uh, institutionalized at all? What I think is in, interesting about the emergence of community arts and what is happening now in some of the countries where this work is new is that uh, pretty much nobody has been trained to, to work in community arts. Those, those artists who first left college in the 60s were trained to be artists. They weren't trained to work with people. They had to make it up as they, as they go along as they went along. And if I, in, so MEF, which I showed you, the, the photography project in Portugal, nobody trained them how to do what they do. They discovered by doing it. And I think that this is, I'm, I'm in favor of the idea that, you know, I love universities and, and uh, uh, art schools and so on. They're terribly important. But I also resist the idea that they're the only source of knowledge that we have. Artists, most artists throughout human history never went, never had any formal education. They learned from other artists. And I think that I'd learned my work from, by working with other artists. So I, I'm not worried about that. I see in uh, Southern Europe, North Africa, other, other places where under the pressure of the situations that people are in, young people want to make change. They want, and if they're creative and artistic, then they use that as the mechanism for how they want to do things. And they're discovering, now it's easier for them to discover it because such stuff is online, but they're discovering ideas and, and practices and saying, well, we could do that. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for your patience. I've never spoken to anybody for so long in my life. I'm amazed at your resilience. <laughs>